Speaking of fire safety. <laughs> yeah, as we obviously um, are as rabbis. Yes, yeah, <laughs> all the time. Um, I don't know how many of these you guys have, but we have over the years had several Hanukkiot come home from nursery or school mm. made from either air dry clay or salt dough or, I mean, there's one that's a piece of wood with bottle tops on top. Mm, um, we've got that one too. Air drying clay <laughs> is actually quite it's flammable. flammable. Mm-hmm. There are little fibres no. through it. And it's like, what are we doing? Please think about the materials that you're using. Rabbit on. Rabbit on. It is so lovely to be back with my rabbiting on colleagues. I'm Rabbi Debbie Young Summers, and as always, I am delighted to be here with Rabbi Miriam Berger and Rabbi Robin Ashworth Steen. A little bit sad to all be on Zoom or whatever it is that we're using again now to be online uh, rather than in person. It was so wonderful to be with you in person and to see our audience. How did you guys feel about uh, our live experience, our first go? I mean, I have to admit, I loved it. And um, I think that's mostly to do with my ego. Um, but it, <laughs> it, it was just such fun. It was such lovely people in the audience. And um, it was just such a, a fun rabbinic experience. Totally new, totally different and um, a really fun way of doing this. Also, just lovely to be able to have this conversation without a screen between us. Yeah, I also loved it despite feeling so nervous beforehand. I think it probably didn't help that to travel from Manchester. It kind of added to the sense of like this being a big thing um, and going out and it was all dark and, you know, we came out to music and applause from the green room. Um, and then at break time when we got to kind of see everyone um, and have a chat, it was just lovely because it's like, oh, it's our people and this is so great. Um, and loads of people have listened and shared thoughts and... Um, that I really feel like we're part of something kind of much bigger, which is really lovely. And just the importance of having like progressive voices out there, asking questions, talking about interesting things. Um, I think, it, yeah, it was great, wasn't it? And um, may this next year, me in Manchester, the <laughs> Northern edition of Rabbiting on Live. I think that'll be very good. Definitely. I think that'll be fun. Yeah. It's actually, it's been so lovely hearing people's responses. I mean, it was so wonderful to actually see the faces of our listeners as we chatted. And that was, you know, added a really nice dimension to things. Of course, a terrifying one because we so often forget that anyone is there. It's just us chatting. But, um, you know, we love hearing from everyone. Um, and, um, you know, we've seen rabbiting on appearing in synagogue newsletters and um, we had a little bit of coverage in the JC after the live. It's always just so lovely to hear from you and what you've engaged with, what it's meant to you, um, questions you have, things you'd like us to do. So you can always be in touch on media at rjuk.org. Um But of course, Hanukkah is now uh, well and truly with us. Um, How are you guys celebrating? I just, I mean, very boringly standard Hanukkah, which actually I'm really happy about. I always feel like I'm I'm never great in the winter. I always find it a bit tricky, although I love when my winter break, we always go to Scotland, but I always find winter a bit difficult. So I'm always very thankful for Hanukkah when it comes because it just gives a bit of ritual, a bit of structure, um, lighting those lights and just bringing people together. And um, there's something, I was talking about this, um, the Shabbat before last, about the beauty of Hanukkah being a homely festival. Like it's one of our only ones, it's just in the home. Um, And it just feels right, doesn't it, for winter that that's the case. I don't have to leave particularly. I mean, I do, but, you know, we to to celebrate it is being in, um, and I've got some lovely vegan donuts this year. You're glad to know. Um, so I've eaten a couple of those already. Um, so yeah, just kind of standard Hanukkah, um, but really appreciating it this year, actually. We had, um, How about you, Miriam? We had a great first night uh, Hanukkah celebration uh, at the synagogue, which we'd kind of build as a, a reception, as a way of just like kind of 
bringing people together to do whatever they wanted to do. So there was options to study and to sing and uh, arts and crafts and this uh, amazing kind of shadow light um, thing that one of our members had created so that we could do mm. a kind of group art project. Uh, we had these Israeli scouts there uh, doing some uh, games with the kids. And and it was just like a an extension of home. It felt like we really mm. had just like invited the community over to our new home, uh, which the synagogue is. And then each night now there's just something different going on, either in um, members' homes mm. um, or at, like a, a sort of an event in which you can light candles. But I know it sounds funny as a rabbi to say there's something really liberating about a festival that doesn't involve a service. Um, <laughs> you know, there's something really lovely about the creativity when you take out the liturgy and you yeah. say, how can we just engage with our Jewish identity that just gives us something short and pretty and lovely to connect to, but actually what do you pin that onto can be, you know, anything. So we've got an Israeli pop star, Batella, um, coming on Friday night uh, to the shul. But also just, um, I also love the overlap with Christmas this year. So, you know, one of our members is hosting Christmas Day, candle lighting at their house. Uh, and what does it mean to just be able to sort of be a small group in someone's home on that day? I yeah, love we've been trying to get that balance between home and synagogue as well. Yeah. We've got some nights Zoom lighting so we can all light together from our own homes. Um, some nights lighting's at the synagogue. Um, we've got a special um, classical concert on Tuesday night with a lighting beforehand mm -hmm. on one of our Stone Grove, ser Stone Grove serenades. Um, we've had a magic party for the kids and... Um, but we, you know, in lockdown, I think we learned the trick of being able to be together via the internet. So actually being able to be at home and light together um, is kind of carrying on from what we learned through uh, through COVID. But also that um, thing of, I think so often people are worried about doing Jewish in their home. What if we get it wrong? What if we don't really know how? And actually being able to say, look, we, we can do it in your home, but without us being there, you, you know, th th it gives people the liberation to say, I don't have to worry about how I do it, but yet I can have done it in my home. And actually, it's really interesting, Robin, that you said this is the festival of doing stuff at home, because actually it's the festival where we also try to be quite public about what we're doing. Mm. We do it at home, but we try to put it outside. We try to put it in our windows. We are, you know, it's a mitzvah to almost witness the miracle to the world. We have public lightings in squares. Um I have a, a ridiculous dreidel wreath that I spent years trying to fix every time it comes out of the box that I made about five years ago. Um, I've hopefully found the final fix this year with sticking it to a kid's plastic plate and writing Happy Hanukkah in the middle. But, you know, as I put that on my door this year, um, that sense of public witness was with me in a really different way. We've had a lot of anti-Semitism in the press recently, you know, David Baddiel's show, um, and actually lots of conversations in my own home about, um, you know, the kids at school practicing, you know, lock-in drills where someone bad's trying to get in. And um, actually on Hanukkah, we really go out into the world and say, here we are, this is us, um, with, uh, with, you know, no shame. Um, we, you know, our live was recorded at JW3. And I remember when they were building, they put up this incredible, bold neon sign that said there's a hole in uh, the Jewish community and we're filling it. Um, and the idea that a Jewish site would be so public about its Jewishness, whenever that was, you know, 10, 15 years ago, was really astonishing and uh, you know, did make me really reflect on what it is to be publicly Jewish. Um, and I think that's part of what Hanukkah is about. It's interesting because I, I think there's really two messages of like, who is the public? Who who are we um, publicizing the miracle to? I think there's very much that sense of like, what does it mean to be out there in the world? Um, I was teaching um, last night using Hanukkah source text that um, Rabbi Neil Jaynes had put together some years ago and um, realized that piece about actually we are the modern day Maccabees, that actually this isn't about us saying to the world, look, we're here as well. We've got our own traditions and our own lights at this time. It's actually about saying to each other, it's OK. You know, don't just blend into the background and assimilate. Um, this is the reminder that, you know, the Maccabees fought for us to be to to 
re-engage with our Judaism and allow ourselves to also be different and unique and to get that balance of being Jews out there in the world and yet be Jews out there in the world. And that takes some navigation as well. I've got, um, I I wasn't sure if we were doing like Hanukkah jumpers today and therefore I didn't know what (laughs) message I was going to be going for, but I've got the like happy holidays kind of vibe of the Hanukkah jumper that for me feels that thing of like, you see, we're all, we've all got festivals to celebrate and these are our lights and they're your twinkly Christmas lights. But Actually, last year, Marks and Spencers gave me like my ability to be the Maccabee of 2022 and to be able to say, well, actually, you know, what is the message? Just that we have to be uh, able to own our own belief and our own Judaism. So, um, you know, there's my believe jumper as well as my happy holidays jumper. Uh, It can depend who the message is for. I think that believe thing is really interesting. I know it was a big hit with um, with our Christian clergy and they were kind of, there was like a Twitter storm of Christian clergy yeah. wearing their believe jumpers. Um, one of the things I love most about Hanukkah is that actually the story has been layered up in so many generations, right? We found new meaning, as is the rabbinic kind of practice, right? It's what rabbinic Judaism has to do post-destruction of the temple in, you know, we start with this story of a tiny army defeating the might of the Seleucids and the Greeks and rededicating the temple and it's actually Sukkot. And then we have, um, you know, much later in the Talmud, the miracle of the little oil that lasted for eight days, because that's the spiritual message that we needed in a time of exile. Today, I think our message really is about how do we make one day's worth of energy last for eight days, right? In a time of energy crisis and climate change. And in every generation, Jewishly, we we create new meaning. And I suppose that word believe is a really interesting one to throw into that mix when we know that we're kind of exploring meaning in the stories that have been passed down. Mm. And Hanukkah is so interesting, isn't it? Because it's, it's a story that isn't in our kind of canon, our scriptures, but it's come out, kind of left field almost and has lots of retellings of it. Um, and I was at a, a talk, a conference at Blackburn Cathedral last week and Rabbi Jonathan Wittenberg was there and he was talking about that the the miracle, well, I'm kind of riffing off what he said, but like the miracle could only begin with us lighting the light. And I love that, like I'm partnership, the idea of it. Um, and reflecting on what you've been saying about kind of, you know, the, the context of the world at the moment, anti-Semitism and lots of isms out there and lots of polarization and um, things, you know, questions about security and things like that. Um, I think there is a real risk that with something like Hanukkah, where we, you know, wonder whether we should be so public with this uh, home festival to make ourselves so obviously Jewish, that we go into the fear and that we batten down and we create, recreate the ghetto and um, keep quiet. Um, And actually, there's an invitation to do the opposite, to open doors and say, this is who we are, um, because I know that we're only going to compound combat anti-Semitism if we have allies and friends and if we're reaching out our hand. Uh, it's like when we got Zoom bombed as a synagogue a few months ago um, and I kind of said to Manchester leaders, we need you to speak out and be alongside us. And they did and it was great. Um, and that's because it wouldn't have worked if we were just saying, if we one didn't say it had happened, which was one option, um, people wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have got the support and built partnerships. And secondly, if we didn't reach out our hands and said, we need to be together, um, we remain in the ghetto. So I think Hanukkah is a really great invitation of resistance and defiance. And I'm always, always remember that picture at Hanukkah, um, which you, you probably know of um, that Rabbi Akiva Posner's wife, Rachel put up in, that she took it in 1931 in Germany of the Hanukkah being lit um, with a Nazi flag flying on the street below them in Nazi Germany. Um, and Hanukkah really being that invitation to us of how do you want your Judaism to be lived, you know, out there, um, proud, being the Maccabees of the day, but maybe Maccabees who are also um, joined in dialogue and partnership with others as well. And actually, for me, that's one of the core values of what it is to be a reform Jew, right? It's not about just looking inwards, yeah. that sense of what it is to be in the world. Um, you know, we were talking about layering meaning in every generation. So this year, Reform Judaism has um, created a sort of supplement for Hanukkah where we can add a reading each night of the festival to celebrate one of the te- eight decades that we are finishing off at the end of this year, this sort of birthday year for Reform Judaism. Um so if anyone hasn't found that yet, you can find it on the Reform Judaism website with a different reading and then a special blessing for each day of the week, reminding us of 
in many ways, the sort of public life of Reform Judaism, what it's brought to us and the blessings and light that it's brought to us, which is kind of one of those things that maybe we take for granted because we don't acknowledge it every sort of time that we turn up to synagogue. Um, and so to be really mindful of that as we light our candles, you know, what's the light that Reformed Judaism has brought us is really beautiful. Mm. It's interesting that so in the different church services I've um, been at, there's been moments where people have come along with a candle and then lit everybody else's candles like down the row and kind of spread that light. Uh, and it always reminds me of um, the kind of Rosh Chodesh uh, idea of on the new moon, we'd have lit our fires on the hillside and the kind of fires would have spread and, you know, that signal would have stretched for miles. Um, and there's something for me about knowing that all our Hanukkiot are in our windows kind of across the country, across the globe. Um, for me, there's something about kind of needing those umbrella organizations like the reform movement that that both stretch us like those readings have across time and be able to sort of stretch those lights back through the decades from pre us where we take all sorts of things for granted and reminds us of um you know the wonderful sessions we've had with uh rabbiting ons with like David Jacobs and Jackie Tabak where they've reminded us of you know reform Judaism before pre us. Um, amazingly, there was reformed Judaism pre us. And then, you know, what it means to be able to then stretch it into the future. And so that, that, that those, those umbrella organizations that allow us to um, umbrella both time from the past and the future and geographical space and link us with communities in Manchester and Newcastle and Edinburgh and, um, you know, Kerno and Totnes and uh, everywhere in between. If my geography was better, I'd be able to know where they were. <laughs> I think we might need to pick that one up with Glasgow, not Edinburgh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Edinburgh's liberal. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that's a whole edit, other Dan, edit. organization that allows us <laughs> to feel that tent even wider. <clears throat> I feel though there is a Hanukkah message that I have to get in. This Hanukkah for me is different to all other Han Hanukkah. Hanukkahs. Anyway, uh, because <laughs> as a staff team, we had our fire safety training last week. And not only did it terrify all of us, uh, but just those like simple reminders of if mm. what we've done is inspire you to put your Hanukkah, you know, on the windowsill, somewhere you might not otherwise be lighting kind of Shabbat candles and other candles that you might light during the year please be sensible. Remember wooden blinds, curtains. Uh, it's not just about them actually touching the flame. It's about just that little gap in between when things get hotter and hotter. Um, please um, don't let uh, this Hanukkah be anything that destroys uh, only something that uh, enlightens and envisions and gives us inspiration. That's, That's so funny. I was looking at a photo of my own Hanukkah set up yesterday after life. And I was like, those wooden blinds, is that a good idea? No. <laughs> like we need no. to pull the blinds yeah. up. Especially not by eighth day. <laughs> like, no, well, know, I'm a member. That which works yeah, on it, the first day might not work on the eighth. Yeah, that's what a member shared yesterday that they'd lit their eight candles, well, nine candles for the last day of Hanukkah. Um, and it was so cold outside and the heat of the Hanakia shattered the pane of glass, which wow. I'd never heard of, but apparently is a thing. And that's definitely made me think, because I guess we want to draw attention to the fact we're Jewish in a positive, proud way, not in a way that we're like, <laughs> you know, exploding things at the end of the road or whatever. So yeah, that's a really helpful message, Miriam. <laughs> I do remember as a kid, my, we had a a tray of all our Hanukkiot and we'd each light a Hanukkiot ourselves and I had a glass one and um like on the last night of Hanukkah my Hanukkiot oh, was no. no more it was melted by all the other Hanukkiot oh my so, god! talking of fire safety <laughs> yeah as we obviously um, are as rabbis yes, yes all the time um I don't know how many of these you guys have, but we have over the years had several Hanukkiot come home from nursery or school mm. made from either air dry clay or salt dough or, I mean, there's one that's a piece of wood with bottle tops on top. Mm. Um, We've got that one too. Air drying clay <laughs> is actually quite it's flammable. flammable. Mm -hmm. There are little fibres <gasps> no. through it. And it's like, what are we doing? Please think about the materials that you're using. Um Although yesterday uh, we went to pick up a few bits for Hanukkah and uh, my daughter decided that because we were 
retiring some of the more dangerous homemade hanukia that really she should have her own hanukia and she'd really like the one with um text messages oh. all over it <laughs> my friend joe sent um, me a photo of it from the judaica <laughs> store <laughs> so i was like i'm so chuffed that you want to choose your own hanukia but not this one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and and I'm like, she's, send me the picture. Let's, let's give you a Hanukkah for your bat mitzvah or something. I know it's a couple of years away, but still. Lots of luck as lols. That kind of thing. <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah. Each, each oh, candle is a different text message. Mm-hmm. Oh, I quite like that. <laughs> well, it's definitely 2022. It is, yeah. So did you, um, did you, have you guys had a chance to look at the MRJ um, lightings and, and themes and what your favourite ones are? <laughs> mostly because Dan wants us to <laughs> I love that sense obviously for me that connection with youth movement um is uh, a great opportunity to see make. I can't say that one because I helped write it okay well that's why <laughs> clearly it was brilliant but that sense for me because it's what we see in family life um the fact that you know I'm loving uh, each time Ben goes off to um, a, a reunion of his dorm from Shemesh last year where the little crew that he shared a dorm with for that week um, get back to socialising. That sense of so many of my friends um, are my friends from my from RSY. The only reason I met my husband is because of our mutual friends through RSY and the idea that kind of from generation to generation, um, it's our youth movement that is uh, helping our communities to flourish. Because I know that what our youth movement, what RSY can do for our kids' Jewish identity is just not always possible within the home or within the synagogue setting. So it's amazing for them to have their own space too. I think the next step of that for me is um, is the first blessing. Um, sorry, the second um, for securing our future leadership. Like that sense that from RSY into being students, what does it look like to nurture the next generation of leadership? To know that we can't just say, well, this is what I'm doing, so this is fine. But actually, we have to always be looking to who is coming through, who is interested in Jewish leadership, whether as a lay leader or as a rabbi. Um, and the the importance of Leo Beck College in that blessing of um, really nourishing our leaders, teaching our leaders, um, but also our role in ensuring that, you know, no one is ever comfortable with where we are that would be reformed judaism not reform and that sense of who is going to take the reins next because it has to be a shared endeavor and we can never assume that someone who's already in leadership is going to be there forever can i give a shout out that my family are doing that well too we've just got our third generation into she's gone cantorial school rather than rabbinic oh, but um it's Madalta. pretty exciting to know that we've got our third generation clergy in my uh, family my niece will be starting her training to be a cantor this summer so i'm very excited for her oh that's brilliant how exciting see future looks bright exactly that's great. Yeah. How about you, and Robin? Did you have a fave? Yeah, we're doing a Northern Hanukkah lighting on Tuesday. And my intention was tomorrow to have a good look through it and use one of the ones. So um, I will do tomorrow. We'll, um, it's we'll a bit test like that, you after. Yeah. For the next test on, we're going to test you on it. Yeah, yeah. I promise I will look. And it's great. I mean, that's why I also love our uh, reform movement because they're, you know, the resources that you need at hand and um, when you get to it, knowing that that's there is great. Um, but they're doing, helps, they doing it helps great, you um, prepare last minute. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Especially at this time of year where it's all a bit kind of frantic before we go away. Um, so yeah, the 80th year and there's lots going on, isn't there? Is there a, a appeal, I think, as well at the moment? Which we need to make sure we're supporting because um, yeah. if nothing else, we need to maintain rabbiting on. And, <laughs> and therefore, I'm just going to do my own self-interest piece of the appeal, which is uh, we want another live and we want producer Dan to keep yeah. uh, helping us record this. So um, let's support the reform movement. Amen. Can you hear us? Yeah, so much, so much for, um, you know, focusing on what does our future look like? We need to form that together and be in partnership together. And these things uh, take investment from time and money. will sponsor a participant from a small community to attend our annual and wonderful Communities That Cares conference. 
£200 will cover 50% of the cost we invest in one young leader at RSY Hadracha Leadership Training. So important. £350 allows us to waive the conversion fee for a baked-in candidate who may not otherwise be able to convert. And £500 will enable deaf members to fully access a service through a British Sign Language interpreter. So please do make your donation this Hanukkah 2022 to the reform movement to enable us to continue doing our important work. Please follow this link to donate www.reformjudaism.org.uk forward slash donate. We wish everyone a Hanukkah Sameach. Um, we needed a bit more of a Hanukkah miracle to uh, keep Debbie here and online with us this uh, podcast. But um, we know that uh, we will be with you again in the uh, new year. We hope that it is a happy and healthy year for all of you and uh, wishing you Hanukkah Sameach. Hanukkah Sameach. Bye, everyone. Bye.